So next up's Joe Gordon, and after that will be lunch. Okay, thanks. Sir. Thanks. So I'll try to finish on time because everyone wants to get to lunch. Um, so this is talking about keeping Pinterest running. Um, so a bit about me, I'm an SRE or Site Reliability Engineer at Pinterest. Um, so what is Pinterest? It's actually not what we're talking about here today, but it's a visual bookmarking service. Um, it's sort of scrapbooking for the internet. But that's not really what we're talking about. We're talking about how we keep it up and running and not what the service is itself. So software versus service. This is a bit about a lot of what this talk is about. This is I came from a software background and I moved over to this, supporting the service. And this is a big change for me was seeing how software is done versus supporting a service. There's some really big differences between running software and service. One of them is stable branches. We have no stable branches. Think of all the time you've had to deal with supporting stable branch. Um, that all goes away. We don't have to support any giant matrix of drivers and configurations. We just support the version we want. Um, we, like to, we don't have to deal with dependency versions. We're just shipping to one uh, set of servers, one configuration. Uh, we pin all our dependencies. You don't have this giant range of supporting a lot of things. Um, and one of the really big differences is a developer support their own service. So for example, if you're working in a service, you're on, you have on-call rotation for that. So if it breaks in the middle of the night, you're going to be woken up in the middle of the night. Uh, and that really helps align incentives between developers and making a service operation uh, work in production. Um, a really concrete exa example of that is monitoring and alerting are built in from day one. Uh, you write software, you're not really worried about how well it works in production, that's somebody else's job, but when you're worrying about that, you build in the monitoring and the alerting uh, capabilities right from the beginning. Um, and lastly, when you're dealing with service, ultimately at the end of the day, you could test all the things, integration testing, functional testing, unit testing, but the real test at the end of the day is does it work in production. So sooner or later, you're going to have to take a risk and try something new in production. So what is Site Reliability Engineering? Um, it's actually a fairly new organization at Pinterest, and so we had to explain it to our executives and others in the company. Uh, so this is how we try to explain it. Uh, world's most intense pit crew. Um, we're keeping this giant system running. Um, Pinterest is about 100 million monthly active users um, across the world, so it's quite a bit to maintain. Um, firefighting at scale, when something goes wrong, Site Reliability Engineers are the first people on the scene to respond. we put out the fires, help the relevant teams to triage, debug, root cause, etc. And lastly, my favorite picture, uh, changing tires while driving 100 miles an hour. Um, you can't let the service go down, that's the first rule, but things are changing all the time, you're trying to fix things, and you're doing it all on the fly while you're driving 100 miles an hour. So what are we actually focused on, well, besides those cute pictures? Um, one of the big things is operational maturity. You come into a new service that's out there, it's very chaotic, ad hoc, is built by heroics, individuals set something up. The first thing you do is you make it repeatable. At least it's maybe not automated, but you actually have a clear set of instructions how to run the service. And then there we make it defined, managed, and optimized. Um, so we take these initial ad hoc services and make them actually work in production um, where they don't, you don't get pager duty alerts in the middle of the night. Another big part of it is operational excellence, which is efficiency, performance, and developer productivity and availability. That really breaks down into a few different uh, categories of engineering, the software engineering, infrastructure engineering, making sure you have the infrastructure set up correctly, process engineering, the right process, and that breaks down into a few bigger, uh, a few things under that. So resiliency features, making sure machines are going down, we're all on uh, Amazon, the public cloud, um, so things are going to break all the time, so you make sure that when they break, things don't go down. Um, setting up service uh, level agreements and monitoring around it to make sure the service goes up and stays up 99.9%, .9%, whatever it is, four nines, five nines, that kind of thing. Um, incident management, things are going to happen. We have incidents. How do we handle them? Um, we have run books for the person who's on call. If they get a page in the middle of the night, we have a list of all the things that hopefully could go wrong and they could look at the run book and see how to fix something, whether it's restarting something or this or that. And the idea for the run books is that the things that aren't automated are there um, and you move things away as they get automated. Um, efficient utilization and making efficiency improvements and capacity planning. Uh, we have a really big fleet, and if we don't be careful about how efficient we are, costs go through the roof. Um, and speed and latency are also really important to that side of things as well as, as is load testing. Um, repeatable deploys, that's sort of the key thing here. We deploy just about all the time, so making sure they're repeatable is really important, and automation and change of management as well. Visibility, this is really a, a crux of the, the system that we, we deal with. Um, we really can't do anything without visibility into our system. Uh, we're a data-driven company like a lot of other companies out there. We don't make any decision without looking at the data. So visibility into our system is really fundamental to that. 
Um, it's really a cornerstone for just about everything we do as an SRE or working on the back end. Um, that's how you measure and enforce the SLAs. We, have, we get alerts if the, the reliability of the site or the availability of the site goes down under a certain threshold. We'll get, uh, we collect that over time as well. We have a whole bunch of time series data to see that. Um, debugging issues. When you're debugging large amounts of machines, you can't just look at a single machine. You want to see this. You want to be, look at the whole entire fleet of machines at once. And visibility really helps with that. And lastly, capacity planning is another big part. Um, we can see how we're doing under utilization and things like that and figure out how much more capacity we need, look at a request per second, things like that. Uh, most of our data is time series. Um, I heard a number from Facebook. It's not an option, so you have hot fixes. The hot fixer you have your, whatever you deploy, you add another single patch onto your code instead of pushing all the new code out that's been committed since then. Um, you have a, we have rolling deploys. We don't do a deploy everything at once. Um, we have a de deploy. Sometimes it takes a minute or two to restart a service. And you don't want to have any impact on the user, so you can't actually turn off all the machines at once, deploy it all, and bring it back up. So you have to make sure you do it in small increments. Um, we also, this teletrain support staging and testing environments um, built in. Um, and lastly, the visibility and the usability uh, of the system are really important because everybody's doing deploys all the time. You want to be able to see when a change went out, when your change went out, what were the differences between any two, to, any two uh, versions of a deploy were to see if there's an incident. You can figure out what caused it. Um, and it should be really easy to use for everybody. Um, Teletrain is fairly simple in design, standard client server model. Um, it's all backed by MySQL. Um, the agents pull the, the service to see what's happening, if it should deploy or not. There's a few basic steps in there pre and post download scripts, uh, pre and post restart scripts, and a restart script. And so, if you're writing a service, you're responsible for those, writing those scripts and maintaining them. So, they're usually pretty simple. Restarting the service is finding whatever thing is managing the service and just sending a command to that, whether it's upstart or whatever. Uh, and lastly, we also have role-based access control for this system. Um, as we grow as a company, we want to make sure that people don't mistakenly deploy something to the wrong service that they shouldn't be de deploying to and things like that. Um, Teletrain has a few advanced features that are really nice for us. You can pause and resume a deploy. A big deploy could take an hour or two hours, potentially, across a really large fleet of machines. Um, so something's happening. You, may, you don't want to roll back yet, but you could pause the deploy and see what's going on. Um, we also have acceptance testing. So before you put the new, service, the new server back in production, you can actually run some tests to make sure that it looks good. Um, you can also do auto deploy. So you have, we have a bunch of services that automatically deploy um, the new code all the time without human intervention. And lastly, this hooks into Amazon, um, Amazon's auto scaling capabilities. So a bunch of our fleets are set up to auto scale on capacity. Um, so it takes care of all that. It's a single nice place to go to. Um, a developer setting up a new service could very easily set this all up. They don't have to know all the, the AWS commands and all the different details to do it. It's all centralized and made simple for only the things they need to care about. Um, this is a pretty standard deploy pipeline you have. So you have, let's say you auto deploy to staging every time there's a new commit to your system. Um, you do some acceptance testing there to make sure it works. You promote it to Canary when you're ready. And then you wait to let's see how it goes in Canary for an hour, let's say, and then you deploy to production after that. When you're deploying to production, you do a rolling deploy, like I mentioned before, to make sure that you don't take the whole system down. And while you're doing that, you monitor the system, and you see if anything goes wrong, and then you can roll back as needed. Postmortems. We don't get things right all the time. We have a lot of incidents. Um, the big thing is we learn from mistakes, and we try to learn as much as possible from them so we don't do them again. Uh, I think the biggest, most important thing about how we do postmortems is that they're blameless. It's no, never anybody's fault why the site went down or something happened. Uh, the important thing there is to find out why it happened and how to fix that in the future, make sure it never happens again. Um, we have incident manager for what managers do well, which is to make sure the ball doesn't get dropped anywhere. Um, the postmortem can take a few weeks to go from start to finish. The incident may happen, you have to schedule a postmortem. It may take a few weeks to put all the, 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 all the fixes in place, and the incident manager takes care of that. Um, there's a few bit basic things to go over in the postmortem. is the impact, what happened, the outage type, um, the method detection, how did we figure it out what happened? Was it a, a, a user sending a bug? Was it an automatic, did an alert go off, that kind of thing? Um, what was the timeline of the, the incident? This is really important because you, you can look back and see where you spent all the time in the incident. The most important thing when an incident happened is getting the site back up, fix the incident. Uh, then you want a root cause after, but you want to first fix all the symptoms. And you look back at the timeline, you'll see maybe you spent 20 minutes wasting time on something else. And when you see this, you could look back and think about it and figure out how could you do it better next time. Um, figuring out the root cause is always really important. So you want to find out exactly why it happened, what happened, um, how do we fix it, what the restoration details were. And one of the really important parts is actionable items for the future. So if something went down, um, how do we fix it in the future? A good example is we had an incident a number of months ago related to a bad config that went out that broke. Um, 
because of DNS. And so because of that, we actually use DNS a lot less. Um, and so we try to learn from these things and make sure these incidents never happen again. And we also have, now that we have these, this good post-mortem process, we have this thing called production readiness reviews, which are sort of pre-mortems, if that makes sense, which I know it's not a word. Um, but it's taking all the lessons we learned from all the post-mortems and applying them to the service before we go to, to ship it to production. So we're always shipping new services behind the scenes first. Um, we get this error fairly often, not too often anymore, but insufficient instance capacity. Um, the cloud isn't really infinite. We all think it is. We all pretend it is. We all say it is. It's not even close to it. Um, a big public cloud doesn't have thousands of machines lying around that are empty. They're always trying to do something. They want to be efficient about it. Um, so you have to make sure that you can actually handle this insufficient capacity errors. Um, one of the ways to do it is you could use reserved instances. That's where you're telling Amazon, hey, we're going to need this many machines for a year, and they make sure that you're going to get those machines. Um, Sometimes we actually have to talk to Amazon about long-term capacity planning. When they're going through, a, let's say, the holiday season, um, they'll work with different companies to make sure they have enough capacity. And we also have to do capacity planning ourselves to make sure that we get the right number of reserved instances and things like that. Um, the, and a side note to this, insufficient capacity is based on the availability zones. You can switch to other AZs and get more capacity that way. Um, everything in Amazon is rate limited, and I mean everything, even described instances. So you're just trying to list all your machines, that's rate limited. So you can't actually have all your different developers and all your different services talk to Amazon directly about that. And because of that, we actually have an internal mirror of the Amazon st state of our system uh, powered by Elasticsearch. Um, so instead of saying, Amazon, what's, list all the machines, we ask our internal, we query our internal system saying, give me all our machines. Um, otherwise, we get everything rate limited, we get DNS rate limited, you name it, it's rate limited in Amazon. Um, because otherwise, somebody would just break the system. Um, you can get noisy neighbors in the cloud, as I think a lot of people are aware. Uh, and Amazon, there's an easy trick around that, which use the biggest instance size for that, and that's the biggest in a class, like a C3 class, the C3 8XL, which is the biggest one, and that's a full machine. Um, one of the big problems we've been having is right sizing. So if you're launching a new service, what size machine should you use? Just use the biggest one they have. Should it be a, you know, that, what, you have 10 or 20 sizes, potentially, you want to need to pick the right one. Um, and it turns out to be hard to figure out what the right one is and all that. Another really hard problem is ownership. When the cloud is great because everybody gets resources really quickly, but how do you know what resources are doing what? You may just have thousands of machines literally doing nothing. Um, and so finding out, you want to know at any given time who owns that machine that's running on the, on the cloud. Um, so you have to work out some sort of system to make sure to man figure out who the ownership is for each system and each service. Um, like a lot of other big companies, we do a lot of open source work. Um, we're trying to always do more, and we can always be better at it. But there's quite a few tools that we've, um, we've open sourced over time. There's a big one that we've used. Um, Amazon, or Pinterest is all backed by MySQL. Everything about it is MySQL. It's a huge MySQL deployment. We have hundreds and hundreds of MySQL servers. Um, so it, our MySQL DBAs, which we have two of them, have worked really hard to get this nice set of utilities they use to actually manage large fleets of MySQL servers. Um, one of the hard parts you're doing in our case is all on Amazon. I mean, machines could go, go down at any given time. Any given day, we have some sort of incident. Some of the, one of my SQL servers will go down at any given time. Um, so we have to handle all of that. Um, we use Thrift internally. Um, so we have this nice tool to introspect Thrift traffic that's really helpful. Uh, one of the really nice things we use also is uh, something called Secker. Secker, I'm not sure to pronounce it, honestly. Um, we use Kafka for all our, our traffic. Um, and it's a way of persisting uh, Kafka logs into S3. Um, use that for things that we need to tr keep track of important data over time. You could use it to do uh, offline analysis of our logs. We could see maybe logs of all the traffic, the, the ads being served, something like that. We could get the long-term data on that and do uh, Hadoop jobs on it. Um, Pi Memcache is a pure Memcache client that we use. Um, Pinrepo, which is also the, the diagram at the bottom here, that's how we do all our artifact store, uh, serving. That's how we do all our um, Python packages, our Debian packages, everything else. Uh, that get served up to the machines. That's all done uh, over there. And it's a nice model. We have everything's backed by S3. And on top of that, it's Nginx, all a bunch of stateless services. So it scales out really well, and it works. it's been working really well for us. And lastly, Teletran, the deploy service, um, is going to be open source literally any day now. I know people laugh when they hear any day now, but within a week, it should be open sourced, I hope. Um, there's a whole bunch more that are open sourcing at any given time, and we have a lot more uh, projects that are open sourced at Pinterest.com on GitHub, or Pinterest.github. And thank you. I have five minutes for questions, if anybody has any. In the back. 
Was just That's a great question. Um, everything is relational in our system. S sorry, the question is why do we use relational databases and not something like NoSQL? Um, there's a few answers for that. One is that relational databases like MySQL are really tried and true uh, at really large scale. A lot of big companies use it. Facebook uses it, a whole bunch of others. Uh, when Pinterest started, I wasn't there when Pinterest started, we asked a lot of other big companies how they do it. MySQL works really well at scale. Interesting fact about our system, um, is that we actually store it, we have the key, and then we have JSON blobs inside. So we don't actually use MySQL for the relational part as much as one might think. We just have the, the key, some sort of unique ID, and then a JSON blob in there. Um, but MySQL has all the, the HA properties we need. It shards really well, um, and it's been really battle-tested for a long time. Follow-up? <laughs> um, I'm not going to touch that. <laughs> Is there a question in front? Or? Yeah? Or? No? Oh, okay. Yeah, in the back? When you do upgrades, when you're rolling upgrades, do you upgrade an existing instance keeping it running, or do you still have a new instance and eventually kill the old one? Both. Um, mostly we do, we, sorry, the question is, when you do upgrades, do we turn a new instance on and replace the old one, or do we actually do a replacement in place? Um, we actually do both right now. So some systems have bring in a new set of machines and turn the old ones off, but the most of the time we actually do it in place. Um, so that means we take a few machines off, upgrade them, and then put them back in production after. In the back. We deploy, so the question is how often do you deploy and how often do you roll back? Um, we have, I don't know the number of services we have at Pinterest, but we have dozens if not hundreds. Um, we're deploying all the time. You probably deployed a few times during this talk. Um, for example, we have an internal mirror of the latest. We deploy to production twice a day, but we also have for our, our main uh, front-end fleet, but we also have an internal latest version of that we could test things out on. So that's deployed every 20 minutes, I think. Um, and we rolled back, something's rolled back every day at least. Um, we're trying to get better at that, obviously, but the important thing is that rollbacks are easy and pretty painless. Um, two questions. Over here. Right, oh, other side. Oh. Getting there, close, close. Question? Just, just yeah. Sure. No. Um, so the first question is, why not using Amazon RDS? Is there a specific reason why you guys are not using RDS? And the second one is, when you're doing your own MySQL, uh, what clustering technologies are you using uh, for you know, high availability and scalability there? So that's a great question. Um, I can't answer the second one in great detail, but it's all on GitHub for us. So you go to the, the MySQL utils I mentioned before. Um, I'm not a MySQL expert. We do not use RDS because we didn't necessarily trust Amazon at the time when they were running the service. We thought we could do it better, and I think we've... We have two, for a long time, we actually had one, one person running all of MySQL for OpenStack, or for Pinterest. Um, and we now have two now, so it's actually working pretty well for us. Um, so I think we're pretty confident with our choice right now. Um, will we do the same decision again? I don't know. One more question? One more? Oh. Yep. That's a great question. The question is, what's the worst? Uh, the question is, what's the worst outage I've caused? Um, it hasn't been too bad. I think there may be an outage on search for 10, 15 minutes, partial outage, maybe. Yeah, um, I'm actually not sure. I'd have to look back at the notes of what, what, out, out, what the outage was. I'm trying to think back. It didn't cause any big ones, I don't think. Um, yeah. Yeah. Process of testing things before you go into production. Does that does that slow you down, or do you get pressure from developers that you know why is why isn't this in production yet? Kind of thing? Is that a problem? Yeah, so the question is when you do the, the, the um, production readiness review, this or the pre-mortem, does that slow developers down and get a lot of pushback on it? Um, I think people are realizing that it's important and we don't get too much pushback. Um, the truth is if you did everything right, it's actually a really lightweight. It's a Google Doc that's a checklist and you go through it. It takes 20 minutes to fill out. 
Um, and usually the hard part there is fixing the things that were missing. Okay, uh, One question in the back quickly, or no? <laughs> Um, I'll talk to you after. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you for, to Joe. Um, great talk. And uh, we'll be back uh, after lunch.